Hello, everyone, and welcome to the eighth event of Democracy Matters, the second to last event, actually. Uh, I'm Rana Bramitsky, a professor of economics here at Stanford, and thank you all uh, very much for joining us today. There are almost a thousand people uh, in this event today. Uh, the last couple of weeks in politics have been a bit intense and nerve wracking. Uh, the 2020 elections certainly tested our patience and the fact that they took place during a global pandemic didn't help with the stress level either. Uh, the elections also caused many people to reflect on the challenges and promises of democracy in the United States. On the one hand, we saw a deeply divided country and a great deal of polarization. And much of the event today will discuss and unpack these issues of polarization and division and populism and the challenges that they are creating for democracy. But on the other hand, uh, the elections did reveal the strength of our democracy uh, more Americans than ever voted. And we got to see how important every vote can be in the democratic process. Uh, we also witnessed in uh, Kamala Harris making uh, history as the first woman vice president after 48 men and more than 200 years. The first black vice president, the first South Asian American vice president and the first daughter of immigrants vice president. And still there is much work to be done to overcome polarization and division and to start on a process of healing and, and working together. So I'm very happy to host four great colleagues and experts today to discuss the election results and what next. Uh, Anna Ximawa Buse from Political Science will talk about populism around the world. Uh, Francis Fukuyama from FSI will speak about overcoming polarization. Emily Chapman from Political Science will talk about democracy and voting. And Michael McFall from FSI will discuss US foreign policy in dealing with China and Russia. So this is going to be a, a, a great event. As always, each speaker will give a 10 minutes presentation and we will follow with a discussion and with questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions and you can type your questions anytime during the event. We will pose as many of them as possible to the panelists at the end of the presentations. All right. So our first speaker today is Anna Ximawa Buse. Anna is the Michelle and Kevin Douglas Professor of International Studies in the Department of Political Science, the director of the Europe Center and a senior fellow at the Fremont Spogli Institute. Anna is well known for her insightful research on the historical development of the state and its transformation, political parties, religion and politics and post-communist politics. She has published three books, Redeeming the Communist Past, Rebuilding Leviathan, and most recently, Nations Under God. She has also done some great research on populism in formal institutions and the role of causal mechanisms in social science explanations. Uh, now, Anna has received many awards uh, for her research, including the Alexander George Award for Best Article in Qualitative Methods, the Ed Hewitt Prize for Best Publication on the Political Economy of the Former Soviet Union, the Lubert Award for Best Article in Comparative Politics and the European Politics Best Paper Award. And Anna is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science. She is also a Carnegie Fellow and recently she was awarded the prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship. So welcome Anna and thank you very much for being here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ron. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to be here and I'll talk about populism around the world and situate um, our populist moment in the broader setting. So many of, of you, of course, have already heard about President Trump as a populist. Googling him as a populist reveals over 10 million hits. And there's been a lot of talk about um, populism and Trumpism um, in research analysis and opinion pieces. Um, President Trump is, much, is part of a much bigger group of populist politicians and political parties around the world, ranging from Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, Narendra Modi in India, um, you know, Ed, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, and President Duterte of the Philippines, making his characteristic gesture here in front. And so today, what I'd like to do is to talk about three different things. First of all, what is this thing called populism? Secondly, how did we get here? What are its causes? And third, what are the consequences? How do you know it? When you see it, how do we get here? And why do we care? So first, what is populism? I think one of the best definitions basically identifies populists, politicians, and uh, parties as always making two critical claims. 
The first of these is that the status quo elites are a corrupt, self-serving cartel. They're basically interested in, in it for themselves. Secondly, as a result, there's a need to represent the people as the people. And so if you hear parties or politicians making those two claims, you know they're populists. They've been very popular. Um, as you can see, this is a graph that basically um, displays the support for populist parties in Europe, Asia, and Latin America um, since the 1920s. And notice the pattern. Um, there are much higher levels of support for populists in Latin America pretty consistently. But there's also something else that's going around. Around 2000 or so, around the turn of the century, you basically see a consistent rise in populism in every region here, um, in Europe, in Latin America, and in Asia. So the question is, what caused this? On the demand side, we have a lot of people talking about the ways in which voters have, have experienced globalization, inequality, immigration, and the cultural grievances that come with a rapidly changing society. But what I would argue is that we also need to look at the supply side. And here we need to look at the failure of centrist mainstream governing parties to provide the kind of policy alternatives and the responses that would otherwise um, have let uh, populists not to become popular. And what I will argue is that a lot of these parties have become unresponsive and indistinguishable from each other. One notorious example are, for, uh, are the convergence third way politics of the 1990s, when Bill Clinton of the US Democratic Party, Gerhard Schroeder of the German Social Democrats, and Tony Blair um, of Labour all basically made the shift from sort of, you know, being somewhat leftist parties to increasingly sort of preempting um, right wing parties' stances and programs. Here they are in a more affectionate moment. Um, and what basically what this means is that by the 2000s, um, parties on the right and the left in many cases are seen as being very similar. They're basically seen as being indistinguishable, even though of course the differences remain. And populists capitalize on this. They basically argue that this kind of elite consensus is evidence of, elite, of an elite cartel. They basically say a pox on all their houses. There's no difference between any of these parties. They're all captured by corporations and we need to better represent the popular will. They make all kinds of appeals to sovereignty, to national renewal, and to rejection of the existing system of institutions and elites. And we see examples of this in the 2016 Brexit referendum, we want our country back, and the appeals of President Trump during his campaigns. What do you have to lose? We are the only alternative left. Now, if that's what populism is, and those are some of the causes, what are the consequences? Well, the consequences of populism in government follow directly from their commitments. First, if elites are a corrupt cartel, so are the institutions and norms that they have created. Secondly, if people have to be represented, we have to define the real people and make sure that they are the ones who get the representation. So as a result, we have seen three different kinds of consequences for democratic institutions, for in informal values, and for national identity once populists come to power. So populists, first of all, erode formal institutions. There's almost a template here. They first attack and politicize the judiciary to bring it basically under control. They go after oversight and regulatory institutions, um, environmental protection agencies, ombudsmen, those kinds of um, regulatory agencies. They attack the independence of the media and civil society. And then eventually they try to change the legal framework, um, going as far as to rewrite constitutions in some cases, and nearly always trying to rewrite electoral laws to favor themselves. And what all of this has in common is that basically these are institutions that hold governments, populist or otherwise, in check. And populists deliberately erode those kinds of checks and balances on their power. So when President Trump cast doubts on election integrity, this might on one hand be an unprecedented attack in US history. On the other hand, it is characteristic of populist rhetoric and the populist undermining of the formal institutions of democracy. And as a result of these efforts, if we look at the countries that have uh, so made the turn towards authoritarianism, who have de-democratized the most, um, we see that populists basically spearhead the effort. These are the 10 countries that according to VDEM, which is a Swedish public opinion institute, um, the 10 countries that have made basically the greatest, um, have seen the greatest erosion of democracy in the last decade. And you'll notice that six out of those 10 are all led by populists. So it's not that all democratic erosion is caused by populists, but populists basically are a sufficient condition for democratic erosion. If you have populists in power, they will erode democracy. Excuse me. 
Secondly, populists undermine democratic norms. They attack the opposition and see it as illegitimate. They denounce the media as fake news. They abandon norms of conflict of interest, transparency, and anti-nepotism. And they tend to politicize the state um, and the police forces. And this can range from the kind of attacks that we see in Turkey, where thousands of journalists, educators, and students were arrested and attacked for their opposition activities, or the use of state violence in the United States um, against perceived opponents, as happened this summer in the protests um, here in Lafayette Park. Third, populists redefine the people. They divide the society into good and bad. They polarize society. Um, the opposition is traitorous. The loyalists are good members of the nation. Um, they also tend to implement laws that make this stick. For example, the new citizenship law in India deliberately discriminates against Muslims and makes other non-Muslims um, basically much easier to apply for citizenship while making Muslims into second-class citizens. And the point here is that only certain gr groups belong to the nation and the rest basically um, are rejected and uh, polarized against. At the same time, however, there's you know, a point here about what's known as executive underreach. The fact that some populists are incompetent, they're unwilling and unable to respond to major crises. One sort of explanation for the coronavirus pandemic um, and the response to it, the inadequate response to it has been a kind of populist bungling where populist countries tend to be unusually badly affected. If we look at the countries here, these are, in, in, again, it's not the case that all countries with high rates of deaths are populist, but nearly all populist countries have higher than average death rates. Um, the United States and the United Kingdom, by the way, are in between Brazil and Italy. So once again, populism is a sufficient but not necessary condition, not just for democratic erosion, but for the kind of executive underreach and bungling of basic responses to crisis. So the global lessons here are that populism is on the rise um, in this century, certainly. It is sufficient for the erosion of democracy. And the real worry here is the lasting damage that it does to both institutions and to norms. Thank you. That was really very insightful. Thank you so much, Anna. And uh, our next speaker is Francis Fukuyama. Francis is the Oliver, Olivier Nomellini Senior Fellow at FSI, the Director of FSI Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, and the Director of Stanford's Master in International Policy Program. Now, Francis has written widely on issues in development and international politics. His award-winning 1992 book, The End of History and the Last Men, has been highly influential. It has appeared in over 20 foreign editions and has about 25,000 citations last I checked. And Francis has written many other influential books uh, like The Order of Political Order, Our Post-Human Future, and most recently, Identity, The Demand for Dignity, and The Politics of Resentment, Political Order, and Political Decay. Francis holds a number of honorary doctorates and he is a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, as well as at the Center for Global Development. He is on the Board of Governors of the Pardi Rand Graduate School and the Volcker Alliance, as well as a member of the American Political Science Association and the Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome, Francis. Thanks very much for being here, and it's great to have you. Thanks very much, Ron. Uh, you had asked me to speak about overcoming uh, polarization, and uh, I would have to say that I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Uh, so what I'm going to do is talk about some ways that other societies have overcome polarization and uh, ask whether this is possible in the United States. I think if we don't solve this problem, uh, we are going to continue a decay of our political system that is going to weaken us relative to other countries. I would say that our polarization today is the single uh, biggest liability that the United States as a society have, which means that we cannot address uh, serious problems either domestically or internationally. And so it's a really critical problem that needs to be solved. Uh, there are really three uh, approaches that have been suggested and have been practiced uh, by other countries that are in a similar position. Uh, the first one is that you experience some kind of an exogenous shock uh, that basically makes everybody realize they're in the same boat and they need to cooperate. The second is somehow to do it uh, through a, a practice of a kind of visionary leadership. Uh, and the final one is just 
using plain old politics to get out. And I'll, let me explain uh, each of those in turn. The exogenous shock one um, probably can be best uh, illustrated by Japan and Germany in 1945. Both of those countries had suffered polarized uh, uh, politics, extremism, aggression, uh, and then they were bombed relentlessly for several years and their populations so completely traumatized that they were ready for a very, very different kind of political order uh, after their uh, defeat. I mean, that's an extreme example. Now, the United States has gone through a number of external shocks, not anything on that scale, but pretty serious ones. The September 11th attacks, the uh, 2008 financial crisis, and then the COVID pandemic. And what I think is really remarkable is that each one of these shocks didn't bring Americans together. They actually deepened uh, the existing polarizations. And so in the end, you know, we were left um, more, more polarized than before. And I hate to think what kind of a external shock would be sufficiently large that it really would convince uh, uh, Americans that they need to pull together. And it's probably something we don't ever want to really uh, experience. So I'm afraid that that's uh, a kind of deus ex machina that we shouldn't be hoping for. The second uh, route is a kind of conventional wisdom that it's it's really visionary leadership uh, that will get us out of it. And I think Joe Biden clearly has been moving in that direction. Now, I have to say, uh, you know, we've had leaders, a leader, who for four years has been doing everything he can to deepen the polarization. And so it's certainly the case that if you have somebody that stops doing that and that actually does speak as Biden has spoken already in the past week since the election about bringing Americans together and being one nation and not divided into red and blue, it's at least going to uh, not worsen things the way uh, they have been in the recent past. But I don't, think uh, right now that it's likely that uh, that by itself is going to do very much good. Uh, you know, the real question for the future is the calculations of the Republican Party. And I think given the fact that, you know, many Republican politicians are jumping on board with the Trump strategy to try to delegitimize the election and claim that it was fraudulent, it doesn't augur well for uh, a smooth transition uh, of power, uh, and it suggests that when we get to January, when uh, President-elect Biden is actually sworn in, that Mitch McConnell is going to behave in exactly the way he did in 2008. That is to say, he's going to uh, basically say, I'm going to do everything in my power to make this a failure of a democratic uh, administration. And, um, you know, beginning with the confirmation of cabinet officers, uh, uh, he's not going to get a bit of um, uh, cooperation from what looks like it's probably going to remain a, a Republican uh, Senate. And in any event, uh, the Democrats did not win by a landslide. Uh, there's no huge mandate on Biden's behalf uh, to really take, you know, very strong measures. So I think uh, politically we can expect this polarization, the political polarization to continue. The third um, uh, alternative is is um, one that I call just using ordinary politics, uh, but it's based on one specific historical precedent. Uh, in the late 19th century, the United States was uh, in many ways as polarized as it is today. The Republicans and Democrats traded both the presidency and control of Congress virtually every two years from uh, the 1870s on um, up until the 1896 election, which has been called by many political scientists uh, a realigning election, because at that point, the Republicans won the presidency with the election of McKinley over William Jennings Bryan, uh, and then took control of both houses of Congress. And they basically kept that for the next 16 years. And that's really what has per what permitted the whole progressive era to uh, unfold with all of the big, big shifts in American politics. And I think we're actually at a similar kind of moment because the issue in 1896 was what kind of country did the United States want to be? The Democrats and Republicans actually had flipped positions. So the Republicans were the Northeastern urban industrial party that wanted a modern, um, uh, rapidly growing America. 
and the Democrats were the nostalgic, backward-looking agrarian uh, populists uh, uh, from rural states that didn't want that kind of change. And, you know, there was this fight between the two, and ultimately the country made up its mind with that election, and it said, okay, we are going to be this urban industrial uh, powerhouse, and that um, uh, decision was made. Now, I think that many Democrats for this election hoped that the unpopularity of Donald Trump would actually potentially lay the grounds for this. And I think they have been expecting that the basic demographics of the country uh, would push things inevitably in that direction because people that tend to vote Democratic, you know, younger people, um, uh, racial minorities, you know, educated people and so forth have been growing at a faster rate than the core Trump base of relatively, you know, less educated, uh, more rural um, uh, voters. Uh, and, you know, there's a feeling that there would be a kind of inevitability to this, you know, just simple demography um, uh, producing uh, this kind of a, a, a national realignment. And it did not happen. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's actually quite remarkable that um, the Republican Party, apart from Mr. Trump, actually did pretty well in this uh, election, you know, and you have to take account of the fact that over 70 million Americans voted for Trump. Uh, and so I think that uh, the realignment can still happen, but uh, it has to be based on a very careful uh, analysis of what of why it's not a, a, a occurred up to this point. And I think we've already seen the beginnings of that discussion. I mean, the Hispanic vote, you know, was expected to flip Texas uh, and maybe even Florida. And in fact, um, Trump managed to increase his vote shares uh, for Hispanics, as I think people are aware. But he also increased his vote share of African-Americans, both uh, uh, male and female. I mean, there are a lot of, even Muslims uh, voted in higher, uh, percentage terms for Trump this time around than they did in 2016. And so there's something going on here that uh, needs to be studied very, very carefully empirically uh, if there is going to be this kind of broad realignment. Uh, and I actually think that a lot of that 70 million people voting for Trump were not people that really liked him or particularly thought he was doing a good job as president but they didn't like what the Democrats are selling. And, uh, you know, everybody is going to have their favorite theory as to what that problem was. I have my own. I don't think there's any point in trotting these ideas out right now because there's too much empirical work that needs to be done to dissect, you know, why uh, what happened uh, happened. But um, that's ultimately the political route. Uh, if, uh, you know, if one side of this polarized society loses a series of elections and loses them uh, fairly dramatically, then they're going to say, OK, we got to have a different plan and uh, they'll go for it. And then you'll see a less polarized country. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. This was wonderful. And, uh, and next we have uh, our next speaker is Emily Chapman. Emily is an assistant professor of political science here at Stanford. Uh, her research is about how normative conceptions of democracy and shared public values shape democratic practices and how in turn the experiences of ordinary citizens should influence our understanding of the ethics of citizenship and of political leadership. Uh, her current book project, Voting Matters, a critical examination and defense of democracy's central practice, develops an original account of the distinctive role that voting plays in contemporary democratic citizenship and it explores the practical implications of this account for electoral reform and for the ethics of participation. Now, in a recent intriguing article published in the American Journal of Political Science, Emily builds on previous scholarship and suggests making voting compulsory in the United States. She explains that the idea of compulsory voting is that it conveys that each person's voice is expected and is valued, and that there is no such thing as a political class in a democracy. And compulsory voting, of course, can also serve as a reminder for uh, public officials that they are accountable to all citizens. So welcome, Emily, and thanks a lot for joining today. 
Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm really honored uh, to be here and uh, especially to be part of this panel. And then of course, I'm always excited to talk about democracy and voting. Uh, so I wanna talk today about what this election means for the future of democracy, not in terms of who voted for which candidates, but in terms of when, where, and how people voted. But let me begin just by remarking on the scale of the enterprise of this election. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 million Americans voted this year. To me, it's already astonishing to consider that many people engaging in a common activity. It's also important to consider what it takes to make that possible. All of the effort that's gone into printing and distributing ballots, registering new voters, staffing polling places, providing information to voters, then of course there's the collection, processing, and counting of ballots. And on top of that are the tens of thousands of volunteers who spent their time calling, texting, and canvassing to get out the vote. So this election has seen the highest turnout rate in more than a century. An awful lot of time and effort and resources went into making that possible, especially in the extraordinary circumstances of a pandemic. So I begin this way, both because I think it is important to reflect on what we are still able to accomplish despite the many problems that we see in our country, but also because I think it's important to reflect on the point of all of this effort. The sheer scale of elections makes them unlike any other democratic practice or form of participation. Voting is not just some information gathering exercise. If that's all it were, we could probably come up with a better way to do it. But elections also mark these really spectacular occasions of mass participation. And there are moments when democracy becomes concrete and meaningful and when it's really evident that democracy really is about what we, the citizens, do. So it's important when we think about what electoral democracy will look like into the future that we consider how citizens experience elections and how that affects our attitudes towards and our engagement with democracy. And I think it's particularly important to reflect on this now because of how we voted this year. So this year did not just break records for total turnout, it also shattered records for early and mail-in voting. Now, traditional election day voting has been declining for the past couple of decades, but in 2016 and 2018, more than half of voters were still voting at physical polling places on election day. This year though, only about a third of votes were cast in person on election day. And additionally, we saw this really dramatic partisan split in the method of voting. Anyone watching or listening to election day coverage probably heard the constant refrain that early and mail-in votes were really disproportionately democratic this year. And this partisan split also amounts to a meaningful shift from past elections when partisan gaps in the method of voting have been smaller and more of a mixed bag. Um, so we can't really know yet whether this election represents an anomaly or a turning point. Um, on the one hand, it seems pretty obvious that concerns about COVID had a lot to do with why we saw the, both the massive decrease in election day voting and the bigger partisan split in the method since both mail-in voting and concerns about COVID had been polarized. On the other hand, despite the weirdness of this year, it seems reasonable to expect that it will have a lasting effect on how we vote. Um, especially because it has sort of mainly accelerated this existing trend away from traditional election day voting. Either way though, I believe how we move forward with early and mail-in voting after this election will matter a lot for the future of electoral democracy. So while there is much that we don't know about the effects of different methods of voting, and it turns out it's really hard to measure these things, it does seem reasonable to expect that when and where we vote affects how we experience the act of voting and then how we perceive the whole voting process. The experience of filling out a ballot that you received in the mail at your kitchen table, or maybe on the couch while you're watching TV, that's just gonna be different from the experience of filling out a ballot that was handed to you by a volunteer poll worker at your precinct polling place among neighbors who are all doing the same thing. And I do worry about what happens when marking a ballot feels too much like filling out any other form. Most of the forms that I fill out are just about me or my family, about my child's medical history, the make and model of my car, whether I would recommend a service to a friend, Marking a ballot should feel different though from filling out the usual forms because voting is not about me, it's about us. Traditional methods of voting make that sense of voting as a collective act feel real and immediate. 
So being part of a crowd at a polling place or chatting with a volunteer poll worker, even just seeing images of lines of many different people um, at different polling places on TV, these are all vivid reminders that voting is something that we do with other people. Now, because of their sheer scale, elections are really important tools for socializing citizens into our role as democratic participants. Most of the time, it's pretty easy to ignore the mechanisms of governance, but in a healthy democracy, it's hard to ignore elections. So the tremendous resources devoted to elections and the social norm of mass participation in elections help remind us that Yes, in a democracy, politics is for everyone. We all have a right and a responsibility to take part in public decision making. For this reason, it is really important to make voting accessible and to adopt measures that increase voter turnout. But it's also really important to think about how people vote because voting's value as a democratic ritual and as a tool for socializing citizens comes from more than just the fact that so many people participate. The value is also that we participate in this context where the collective aspect of democracy is so salient. And this is important because democracy isn't just about me and what I do, it's about us and what we do together. So yes, I worry that voting will not do as good a job socializing citizens without the tangible sensory experiences of election day. Human beings are just pretty sensitive to our environments, especially to our social environments. And so it would be really surprising to me if the shift in how we vote does not affect voting behavior and political attitudes over time. And I think there's probably good reason to be concerned about what those effects might be. Now, I want to emphasize that these kinds of concerns remain relevant, even if we think that the value of in-person election day voting is outweighed by other things. And even if we think that maybe the ship has simply sailed on election day voting, it's really hard to think about how we could get back to a, a situation in which most people vote in person on election day. But reflecting on how we want citizens to experience elections should still affect decisions about where, when, and how we vote and what election day feels like. So first, I think regardless of whether you favor in-person or mail-in voting, I don't think we should assume that some in-person voting is better than none or that some mail-in voting is better than none. I actually think that universal vote by mail probably comes closer to realizing the value of traditional polling place voting than complicated systems that offer voters a choice of methods. Now, there's a number of reasons for thinking this, but one really important one is that universal vote by mail at least creates a common experience among voters, something that we can talk about and share. I believe it probably also helps with the perceived legitimacy of elections. So it is easy to overestimate the problems and underestimate the importance of methods of voting that we don't use ourselves. And as I think we've seen in this election, this tendency to distrust what is unfamiliar becomes especially serious when methods of voting become so polarized. All right, and finally, we can also think about other things that can affect how people experience elections. Even if we leave traditional in-person voting behind, it's worth thinking about what political parties and communities can do to recreate the excitement and shared experience of election day. And to remind us that voting is about making democracy with many, many other different people and that this is something to celebrate and to cherish. Thank you. This was really terrific. Thank you so much, Emily. And uh, our final speaker is Michael McFall. Michael is the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, the Ken Olivier and Angela Nomellini Professor of International Studies in the Department of Political Science, and the Peter and Helen Bing Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Michael is a leading expert on Russia, American foreign policy, and democratic development around the world. Michael is also an international affairs analyst for NBC News and a columnist for the Washington Post. He served for five years in the Obama administration, first as a special assistant to the president and senior director for Russian and Euro-Asian affairs at the National Security Council at the White House. And then he served as the US ambassador to the Russian Federation. He, is also, he has authored several books, most recently the New York Times bestseller, From Cold War to Hot Peace, an American ambassador in Putin's Russia. And he has also published many other books, including Russia's Unfinished Revolution, Political Change from Gorbachev to Putin. His current research focuses on American foreign policy, great power relations, 
and the relationship between democracy and development. Welcome, Michael. It's great to have you. Thanks, Ron, for having me. Ron, for having me. Let me unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was supposed to speak about Russia and China. I have a beautiful slide deck on that talk, which I'll happily send to anybody who wants to see it. Um, but uh, given the uh, momentous events of just the last several days, I thought I'd speak more widely and loosely about what the election in, in the United States might mean for democracy worldwide. Um, and I, re I reserve the right to change my mind about anything I say right now. It's, these are more hypotheses based more on intuition and less on data. Um, the first thing I do want to do is to start with to remind everybody listening that the last several uh, years and really decades have not been great for democracy around the world. After the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, there was a sense that the entire world embraced democratic ideas, democratic values, and we were all moving in the same direction towards adopting these uh, sets of values and institutions. Over the last 14, 15 years, that has not been the case. The trend lines have moved in the opposite direction. We're now in our 14th year of a democratic recession, according to Freedom House. We've seen the rise of two very powerful autocratic countries, China and Russia. Uh, third, we've had uh, the breakdown of breakthroughs. Uh, that is to say, moments that, that looked like you were going to have a democratic transition have not consolidated. Uh, going back to the Arab Spring in 2011, uh, that did not yield a lot of new democracies. The only one hanging on to this day is Tunisia, and they're struggling. Uh, Ukraine is struggling. Myanmar is struggling. Armenia today, by the way, as we're distracted, uh, struggling after a democratic breakthrough in 2018. And then fourth, as Anna's already talked about, a lot of old democracies are not doing well and over gradually drifting towards autocracy. Uh, Hungary being uh, very uh, troubling on that list, but also Turkey, as she mentioned, and Poland. And then finally, uh, same with the United States. Um, the way we've been practicing democracy has been eroding. Uh, by, by many different organizations that rate democracies around the world. That means we're no longer a model to the outside world. And two, we have been disengaging in the project of promoting democracy around the world. That started before Trump. That started during the Obama era, uh, in, in large measure, a reaction to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. But under Trump, it got serious, where he just didn't care about democracy abroad and didn't care about engagement generally abroad. Um, against that backdrop, therefore, uh, last week's election in the United States was a momentous positive event uh, for several reasons. One, the election has been peaceful so far, despite all the predictions to the contrary up uh, in the run up to it. Two, there has been no real fraud uh, reported so far, despite the attempts of a small group around the president to try to find it. Free, as some of my colleagues have already mentioned, this was a miracle, folks, that the election administration took place the way it did during a pandemic, uh, having to count all those votes in, uh, in a way that states were not accustomed to. Uh, really, I think, um, an, an underappreciated achievement for democracy here in the United States. Fourth, no real foreign interference, despite a lot of worries about that. And then finally, the results, huge voter turnout, as Emily just said, 150 million people voted. Uh, President-elect Biden won the most votes ever in the history of the United States of America. Vice President-elect Harris broke through and made historic history by being uh, elected the vice president. And we have retired a president with populist autocratic proclivities. Uh, when in the conversation, how do you fight populism? One, it's only one, but one of the ways you do it is you defeat populists in elections. Um, and it's extremely rare in American history for incumbent presidents to lose, and yet that happened. To me, that is all good news for renewal of democracy, irrespective of, of where you fall on policy issues on a le left-right spectrum. And already, I think that you've seen that in terms of the reaction around the world about this democratic renewal in the United States will be good for small d Democrats around the world. You've seen governments, Canada, Germany, France, India already congratulating President-elect Biden. 
uh, democratic activists in places like Russia and Belarus, who I've personally interacted with recently, are inspired by the fact that, as the, the mayor of Paris said, um, America is back. Um, the bad news, of course, my colleagues have already spent a lot of time on it, so I'll go through the list quickly, but more than 70 million Americans voted for a leader who I believe has populist autocratic uh, proclivities. Uh, that's not good. Uh, polarization is not going away. Um, and, you know, polarization, I think, is driven by not policies, but by deep cultural uh, divides, urban, rural divides, racial identities. Uh, as Frank said, we need to dig into the evidence about that. Uh, but I think those are, those are deeper than just what do you think about taxes, and therefore they're going to be hard to go away. Um, Ron, since you mentioned we should add, talk about things to read, I highly recommend Frank's book on identity. I also highly re recommend Jonathan Roden's book called Why Cities Lose that talks about this very deep divide between rural and urban voters in America. Uh, I'm from Montana, my home state, my home city of Bozeman, Montana voted for Biden, but I wanna remind you millions of California, uh, Californians also voted for Trump. I would also remind you that the elites are much more politically and polarized in America, media elites, political elites than the voters are. And, and on that subject, I highly recommend Mo Fiorina's book uh, called Unstable Majorities. Um, and finally, as, as, as Frank intimated, let's not assume that every Trump voter shares all of his extremist, populist, uh, autocratic views. Uh, he was the only Republican on the ballot. And in the same way that many millions of people voted for Biden who don't share all of his views, uh, we should not assume that all of those 70 million are the populist extremists that the, 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 uh, that the president of the United States uh, positions that he adopts. And I think the fight for the soul of the Re Republican Party is coming. I don't want to predict it, but we should not assume that, 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 that we know that long-term trajectory. Um, other bad news. Um, uh, we should also realize that uh, we are still distracted as a country as a result of this uh, polarization. Uh, Armenian democracy might be collapsing uh, as we're chatting here and nobody's paying any attention to what's going on there. And I would say that's true around the world. And tragically, I predict our domestic polarization will make us focus more at home and less abroad. That's bad for small D Democrats around the world. Uh, and then finally, I hope it wraps up pretty soon, but the current antics of some of the Trump team eroding the legitimacy of our democracy right now by making false claims of of gross falsification of, for which there is no evidence, that undermines the legitimacy of our democracy and our reputation abroad. It's exactly what the Russian government is saying. It's exactly what I used to deal with as ambassador uh, in these debates about whether we have a real democracy in America or not. That is not good for small D Demo Dem Democrats around the world. Finally, what will a Biden presidency mean for uh, democracy around the world? Um, I think there's a short term, you know, kind of sugar high that will come and long term really big problems. Uh, so the short term sugar high, um, he will make democracy in America better. I'm confident of that. I worked with him for three years at the White House uh, in the powers that he has. He will do that and that will improve our image around the world as a democracy. Second, Biden believes that value should play a role in diplomacy. He's, he's a values guy. He's not a realist. Uh, and that will be good, I think, for democracy, small d Democrats around the world. Third, Biden believes in the importance of democratic allies. He will renew those relationships with vigor. Uh, fourth, he's already announced a democratic summit. That's a good signal that America is back as a leader of, of, the, of, of the free world, or as, at least as a participant in a coalition of the democratic world. And finally, he will be tough on Russia, he will be tough on Saudi Arabia. Um, China, I think, will be more mixed, but he will not be looking to befriend autocrats like our current president has been doing now for four years. Uh, the bad news is we're not set up, in my view, uh, to deal with what I think is going to be a decades-long fight, an ideological struggle 
between democracy and autocracy, liberalism and illiberalism, the challenge that autocratic China presents with an attractive alternative successful model of economic development, that autocratic Putin champions a populist conservative nationalism that has lots of followers in Europe and the United States. And I think we're still underestimating those challenges and we're not set up as a country to deal with them in a systematic way. Uh, over at the State Department where I used to work, we still have in the same bureau the, the, the group that deals with terrorism with democracy promotion, just as one anecdotal example. And for us to be engaged in this much longer term struggle, I think we have to fundamentally think, rethink how we engage in this struggle of ideas. And tr unfortunately, I don't think there'll be a big bandwidth for uh, um, uh, a Biden administration to do that, given the very big complicated domestic agenda that they will be inheriting on January 20th. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for deviating from your original plan. <laughs> that was great. And uh, as, as participants are now submitting their questions using the Q&A function, let me maybe start by asking you all one big picture question, and maybe we can kind of go in reverse order. Uh, following the US elections, what would, what would be one recommendation you would give the next president to enhance our democracy and strengthen our democratic institutions that you all talk about uh, in, your, in your presentations? And so, you know, you can start anyway, but just maybe, Mike, you want to start? Well, I think it's laid out very nicely in House Resolution 1. Uh, go Google it and look at it. And, and I think uh, adopting all of those ideas would be great. I would add to the list House Resolution 4. Um, uh, but now I need to be a realist. Um, you know, it looks unlikely that the Democrats uh, will win. Let's see what happens in Georgia. Uh, very, very consequential set of elections that are going to be coming there. Um, but if, uh, if one of those two seats goes to the Republicans, uh, Senator McConnell, somebody I've worked with in the past, uh, he's going to do everything he can to to block anything uh, that has been in his response before. I expect it to move forward again. Uh, and that makes me then pessimistic about those reforms, let alone, you know, uh, the big structural things that I personally believe in. I think the Electoral College uh, you cannot defend that uh, arcane institution to me in any sense of a democracy, but, but as a realist, I have no beliefs that it's going away. But that means more uh, immediately, and I think this will happen, um, uh, President uh, Biden will use um, executive decrees to roll back some of the worst um, anti, what I consider anti-democratic policies that President Trump did. And I think first and foremost at the top of those lists uh, will be a set of actions about immigration policy. Um, and I, I desperately applaud those, those plans. Thank you, Emily. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll second the enthusiasm for much of HR1. Um, uh, but I'll zero in on, on one part of it, uh, which actually uh, Professor McFall has, has been active on, which is focusing on making election day uh, a holiday. I think a lot of the talk about this focuses on emphasis on in increasing access to voting and that's certainly part of it. It should be um, a way of making election day voting more accessible uh, to more people. Um, and it won't be a sil silver bullet in that respect, but I think it is a meaningful step. But it also goes a long way towards signaling that um, at the very heart of who we are as, uh, as a nation is that we are uh, a sort of a, an electoral democracy. And this is the centerpiece of what it means to be a citizen of this country. Um, is, is to be a participant. And so I think that making an election day a holiday is a, a way of signaling that this is something to celebrate and it creates opportunities for communities to, um, to create sort of more uh, elaborate and fun celebrations around it. Francis. Uh, well, one initiative I've been involved in in the last uh, couple of months is trying to push a new Biden administration to engage in a big reform of the uh, US public sector, uh, civil service reform. I think that um, 
one of the things that, you know, this is not a winning issue <laughs> uh, for either Republicans or Democrats in normal times, but I think the COVID epidemic has actually demonstrated to a lot of people that you actually need a government full of, you know, nonpartisan expert professional people that can do things like mount a, a crisis response uh, uh, to a health emergency and not fill the government with a bunch of um, political hacks. One of the things that the Trump administration has done in its dying days is to do an executive order about this so-called Schedule F. So right now, as you may know, the American government has about four to 5,000 political uh, appointees uh, that turn over with every change in administration, which is you know, a couple of orders of magnitude larger than any in any European uh, uh, parliamentary uh, democratic system. Uh, and instead of trying to get rid of those political appointees, they basically want to make everybody a political appointee so that everybody can be replaced by some political flunky friend of the president or golfing buddy. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of damage that needs to be um, uh, repaired. And unlike some of, you know, unlike HR1, I actually think that this is politically possible because there are Republicans and Democrats that both, uh, you know, I think would res uh, support a reform agenda along these lines. Thank you, Francis. And finally, Anna. Um, well, I, I go on record as being absolutely um, supportive of what my colleagues already suggested. Um, I'm also very cognizant of the sort of legislative constraints, the fact that both the Senate and the House will have very slim majorities, if any. Um, and so what I would argue is that what we need is a sort of a new commitment, and I think this is what President Biden is going to do, a new commitment to transparency, to facts, to the truth, um, to science, to evidence as basis for policymaking. And that's something he can do all by himself that can, I think, can set the tone for politics for the next four years and hopefully beyond. Because I think some of the biggest damage that's been done is a lack of commitment to any of these. Oh, great. So let's turn to questions from the audience. We have many, many of them. And today I want to invite my bright graduate student, Chris Becker, to moderate the Q&A. Uh, Chris is a PhD student in the economics department at Stanford. His research focuses on the economics and political history of the US South and the political economy of class and race. Chris is passionate about using research as a tool to build more inclusive economic and political institutions. So thanks very much, Chris, for joining and for moderating the Q&A today. Thank you, Ron, for inviting me to uh, moderate the Q&A and thank you to all of the panelists for this really interesting discussion. The first question is going to be for all of the panelists. What are your thoughts on the electoral college versus the popular vote? It's including its genesis, the pros and cons of the electoral college versus the popular vote, any potential changes that could be made, and if there's any relationship between the electoral college and this uh, potential for populism. Uh, Professor Jamal Abusa, could you begin? Sure, well, I personally think the electoral college is antiquated and it is profoundly anti-democratic, it distorts um, representation and it removes us from one man, one vote to basically having land vote in effect. Um, so I'm opposed to the electoral college and I think that it also gives rise to populism precisely because it amplifies some grievances and reduces representation of others. Uh, Professor Fukuyama. I agree normatively and um as a matter of practical politics, that the Electoral College has outlived its usefulness, but it's just not going to happen, uh, you know, with the uh, Republicans uh, remaining in the position that they were, even if the Democrats had taken the Senate, this would be a big uh, uh, struggle because this is a, um, a constitutional matter where you need a big supermajority, both in the states and in Congress to get any kind of change. So I just think that that is not on the on the table. There's other uh, non-constitutional approaches like this idea that states should commit to uh, allocating their delegates to the winner of the national uh, popular vote and it wouldn't kick in until states representing more than 270 uh, uh, electors uh, agree to do this, uh, which would get around the electoral college but not requiring a constitutional amendment. Um, so maybe that will go somewhere and I would support that. But again, that's gonna be a hard slog because the Republicans 
you know, this is this is one of the things that's keeping them in power. So why should they give up on it? Uh, Professor Chapman. Sure. Yeah. So I, I also agree that the Electoral College is not a particularly useful institution, but also with the skepticism that we can do uh, much about it. I do want to raise some concerns about the um, use of the popular vote as a um, necessarily a better um, indicator of, of who ought to be the representative um, for the entire country. I think there is a a challenge when you have a single person who is understood to be a representative of the entire country. And when you do have the kind of urban rural polarization that we have, I think that you're going to have serious crisis of legitimacy either way. Um, I would think that, you know, if we're sort of throwing out our pie in the sky ideas for how we want things to go, that having some a more kind of consensus oriented electoral mechanism, some kind of ranked choice voting, perhaps, um, uh, to at least ensure that the president has a true majority and not just a plurality um, of the, the popular vote would be an important part of, of moving forward with that. And Professor McFall? I agree. Uh, we can move on. Uh, the Electoral College should, be, should go. You know, my, my compromise is let's keep the Senate the way it is. Um, which is also very antiquated and overrepresents, uh, you know, my my relatives in Montana. Um, but that practically, I don't think, is a, a conversation we're going to have anytime soon. I mean, I I put in the chat. I I don't know if all of our participants can see our chat or not, but I put the the project that that Frank has mentioned about this uh, idea that each state will commit once we get to two seven once two hundred and seventy uh, of them. Uh, have committed to it that they will uh, transfer all of their electoral co uh, college votes to the popular vote. But it's, it, as you can see from the status report, they've got a long ways to go. I will make sure that uh, to send it later after the, after the event to everybody. Okay, thank you everyone. The next question is for Professor Jamal Abusa. Uh, populist wings have emerged in both the Republican and Democratic parties, but with very different goals. Will these populist challengers change the trajectory of their respective parties? And what can the responses of the establishment members of the parties tell us about, um, tell us going forward? Um, well, I think in the case of the Republican Party, that ship has sailed. Um, so the populist challenge has transformed the Republican Party, and we can see that in the sort of cordon sanitaire that's being erected around President Trump right now. Um, when it comes to the left wing um, and to the Democratic Party, I think what's going on is, you know, the populists within the Democratic Party, such as they are, mostly have a clear policy goal. It's basically redistribution um, and you know, more and greater social policy. Um, and in that sense, they're acting more as a sort of a leftward faction within a mainstream party than they are sort of a radical way of changing how the party construes itself um, and its rhetoric. So I think that kind of a challenge is more easily co-optable. Um, it simply means either ad adopting those policy stances or not. Um, but it's not a question of transforming the party and how it goes about doing its business. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Professor Fukuyama. It feels like a lot of the polarization is due to totally separate streams of news and facts. Is there anything that can be done about that at this point? Um. Well, I think that we're waking up to the role of uh, the internet and social media companies. You know, um, this has been going on for some time, the destruction of uh, fact checkers and established uh, uh, information sources. And, you know, you're in a world where anyone can say uh, anything. Um, we've actually been working on an antitrust uh, working group at Stanford that is trying to deal with this because I do think that there is a big problem with the underlying power of the platforms. Right now, people are, are not that unhappy with them, at least on the left side, because they've largely been going after President Trump's tweets, and, and, and certainly the Republicans think that they're all aligned against them. But in the longer run, I think that you are going to need a better way of filtering uh, the internet um, uh, through a, you know, a greater diversity of uh, filters that would try to replicate, you know, in a way, uh, what the traditional uh, media looked like. Uh, but, you know, we've made some progress in at least making people aware of how incredible the power is of 
uh, you know, these companies to actually change political outcomes, to distort representation, uh, to promulgate conspiracy theories, you know, all of this stuff is new. And I think it's really going to take a while to, uh, you know, get a handle on it. Thank you. The next question is for Professor Chapman. Uh, more and more daily activity is conducted via cell phone. Um, do you see a time that even vote by mail is obsolete and our cell phone becomes the dominant method of voting? Obviously security issues would have to be addressed, but doesn't this seem like our future? It's, it's quite possible. I think there are already countries that have done some experiments with internet voting. Um, I don't know to what extent they used um, mobile devices in that. I think that, I mean, it's really hard to say because it, it's also hard to know by the time we do get around to figuring out how to address these security issues, whether cell phones will still be the, the predominant uh, uh, technology that we use to do these daily activities. Um, so there may be some some changes that happen uh, in the future. But yeah, it's, it's not hard to imagine um, that happening. I think it's still a, at least a decade off though, if not more. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Professor McFall. What do you think will be the most pressing foreign policy problems faced by the Biden administration? And how can we, how can we expect the Biden administration to respond? What do I think it should be or what do I think it will be? Those are two different questions. You can answer both if you want. <laughs> um, well, as I said before, I, I think the Biden administration is going to be completely overwhelmed uh, with dealing with the pandemic and the recession. Uh, you know, I joined the government in January of 2009 in the Obama administration, and it was the, it was the same feeling. Uh, there was not a lot of bandwidth for uh, foreign policy because of what we were dealing with in uh, with respect to 2008. I think that that is. You know, you, you, you and Ren are the, uh, Chris, you guys are the experts, not us. But um, uh, my, my suspicion, just listening to the way they're talking, they're, that is going to be their focus. And so there's not going to be a big agenda uh, right away. Having said that, I think the first thing will just be restoration uh, of alliances and kind of showing up again, uh, rejoining Paris climate uh, agreement, rejoining the Iran nuclear deal, if they can do that. Um, so, you know, re-engagement uh, will be the first order of business. Um, and then second, after that, I think, you know, how to figure out um, a strategy of containment and engagement vis-a-vis -vis China uh, will be the second biggest priority for them. Um, I, you know, I, their view, I mean, I know lots of people that, that work in the Biden team, uh, is that President Trump has been very react. Re um, reactionary, erratic, moving from, you know, one day she is our best friend to the next day he's Stalin. Um, and, and they're hoping that they can have a more balanced approach. Uh, but it won't be just going back to four years ago. I think it'll be, uh, there will be more coercive deterrent containment aspects to the policy, uh, but also at the same time to cooperate uh, when it's in the American national interest. And then third, this thing I said about values, I don't know, you know, lots of presidents have said that before and it peters out sometimes. Uh, but I do know, um, having worked with uh, Vice President Biden, that this is something he personally believes in. And so uh, that more generically, I think, will be an aspect of, of foreign policy. And then one last thing I would say, which will go unnoticed, but I think will be quite important. Um, you know, the Biden team, again, leave policy issues out, uh, aside, whether, whether you think we should join the Iran agreement or not, you know, the, those are legitimate policy debates. Uh, he's going to bring with him uh, a very talented, experienced team um, that, that we have not had in the Trump administration. We haven't had a lot of assistant secretary positions filled, like we don't have a secretary of defense today. It sounds like we don't since we've been on this call, we've now lost our director of CIA. I, I don't know if I should be careful. I don't know if that's happened. It's in my, my Twitter feed right now that it's about to happen. And it's been the interagency process in the Trump administration has been, well, let's just let me put it diplomatically, has been deeply flawed and broken. That will repair uh, in the Biden era. And so Nagorno-Karabakh, which, you know, is, uh, you know, there's just been a war there that we used to be, the United States used to be a member 
of the Minsk group with Russia and France to, to deal with that crisis over the, over the last two decades, we've been completely AWOL. Uh, we, we're not involved at all. Putin's running that show. At, so at those levels like that, like how to deal with Belarus, uh, what to do with Kyrgyzstan, there's been a lot of turmoil in Kyrgyzstan that most Americans will never pay attention to. The Biden team will bring assistant secretaries, deputy assistant secretaries, that will help to engage America in those kind of uh, uh, problems around the world, which we've kind of been absent from for, for some time now. Can, can I uh, interject something on foreign policy? So uh, you're asking about challenges that the next administration is likely to face. I think one of the biggest ones is gonna be over Taiwan. Uh, President Xi gave a speech almost two years ago now pledging that uh, Taiwan would be reincorporated into China within the decade, and already two of those 10 years have passed. And he said it's going to happen uh, either peacefully or by force if necessary. And, you know, people just do not take this seriously. But I think that if there is a move against China by, by the PRC, that will put us in one of the most difficult decisions that we have faced in our uh, foreign policy, because that's a really major uh, potential military confrontation, but it's also something that, you know, in a certain sense, we're morally obligated to follow through on. And I don't think anyone has any idea how we're going to deal with a, a, a crisis like that, uh, either Democrat or Republican. Thank you. So the next question is going to be for all the panelists again. With democracy eroding because of wealth consolidation, how will we address the problem of campaign finance with the wealthiest donors being the most uh, polarized? Professor McFall, would you like to begin? No, I don't want to begin. That's too hard of a question for me. <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously, it's a huge, hard problem. I don't have an answer. Um, you know, I want to look at the data from the election, I think, as others have said. You know, there's a lot to be studied here. Um, but my own view, you know, influenced by my colleagues in, in the Department of Political Science and FSI, is as these uh, positions, uh, these polarized positions are pretty entrenched. And to, to, to say that um, they'll be moved by less money in the election, I, I'm, that's a hypothesis. You know, the person that's asking that question is posing a hypothesis. If we had public funding, would it lead to less polarization in terms of the rural urban divide? I'm not so sure, I don't, I don't know. I know normatively, I don't like it at all. Uh, and I would like to see it change, but I don't know empirically if that is a reform that would actually change uh, the dynamics in our country. But, but I wanna to defer to my other colleagues. It's a really big, hard question. Uh, Professor Chapman. Sure. Uh, so I also think that this is, is one of the hardest questions and um, I'm similarly skeptical. I think there is a tendency to believe that if only we could fix the campaign finance problem, then all of our political problems would go away. Um, and I think we should really resist that, that part of why the campaign finance uh, problem is does seem like such a problem is because it's really hard to get anything right when you have such extreme conditions of polarization. Um, there's not not a nice um, fix for any of that. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm certainly in favor of of um, experimenting. I, I think you know we've seen states um, experimenting with various kinds of campaign finance regulations, and then also uh, you know localities experimenting with voucher systems. And I think that's a good way of sort of figuring out what might work. Although the campaign finance situation at the state and local level is very different from what it's like um, at the the national level. Uh, but I'll also add that it. It's important to be aware of what kind of um, problems we might be borrowing with any kind of regulation. I think one of the concerns is that when you eliminate um, sort of money as a source of political influence, other things are going to come in and you see kind of the role of fame and political dynasties being particularly important there. So, I mean, this was a big deal with Trump initially that he didn't actually have to spend as much as other candidates. Um, and so at least the value of money is that it's fungible, even though I think that um, the consolidation of wealth, uh, as the question asker said, has become a huge issue um, uh, that we should worry about. I'm just 
yeah, I'm at a loss to figure out how we deal with it. Ambassador Jamal Abusa. You know, I, I would agree with Emily and with Mike. Um, I'd also add that from a comparative standpoint, um, you know, we see authoritarians and populists and democratic erosion arise as well as polarization, um, both in states that have state subsidies for parties and a system of public funding, and in states that basically are free for all and all kinds of dark money flows in and out. So it doesn't seem that the system of campaign financing has a direct impact on the kind of polarization or democratic erosion that we might observe afterwards. And then Professor Fukuyama. I, I don't have anything particular to add to that. Okay, thank you. The next question is for Professor Jamal Abusa. Would you characterize the contemporary populist wave you describe as a right-wing wave? And if so, do you see cross-country commonalities in how populist leaders have managed economic public policies and popular demands for redistribution? Do you see demographic commonalities in their social bases or voting blocks? Right. So I think on the issue of uh, right wing versus left wing, what we tend to see um, is a lot of left wing populists in places like Latin America and also in Southern Europe. Um, and the general uh, explanation is that those are places with limited social policies where left wing populists take over on the promise of delivering broader social policies and a much more inclusive nation, notion of citizenship and the nation. Um, we see right wing populists in countries in Northern America and in Europe especially those where there's been a wave of immigration that is seen as straining the system of social policies and the welfare state. Um, and that's been the sort of the classic response that we observe in Europe, for example, where um, so sort of the whole wave of immigration is now captured as both a threat to the labor market and as a threat to the welfare state system, in addition to also posing a cultural threat to the sort of homogeneity of these countries. So I think the first thing to know is that there are both left-wing and right-wing uh, populists we observe the right-wing populists in the United States and in Europe. And once in office, you know, most of them have been constrained by coalitions and have been unable to accomplish much. Um, when they are fully in power, as they are in Poland, Hungary, Turkey, or the United States, what they tend to do is to pursue kind of a nativist, uh, welfare chauvinist policy of limiting immigration, excluding groups from social policies, or targeting specifically to their, um, their supporters and basically eroding the formal institutions of democracy. And, and Chris, can I just jump in on that? Sure. Uh, just, I'm just echoing uh, what, including things Anna's read, written before, but I think it's really important for people to understand when we use these terms, there's, there's oftentimes this conflation of liberal conservative and then populism on a two by two matrix. I just wanna underscore that that, that left right divide, that economic divide that, that is just lingers in everybody's head from, you know, 50 years ago is is fading. Um, you know, if you listen to, to Republic, I probably listen to more, more of these folks than I should, but, you know, right wing populists, including Fox News Now, listen to Laura Ingram some night, folks. Uh, Laura Ingram is making the argument over on Fox that the Republican Party is the party of the working class. Um, and so that doesn't fit neatly in this left right economic class base model that we, we, we tend to start with. And I just wanna make sure we understand that that is, a, that is something new and it's not just in our country, but it's especially true, I think, in our country. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Professor Fukuyama. Can you discuss how national service might be beneficial to the uh, United States? <laughs> Glad you asked that question. I was actually gonna uh, add it uh, at the end of my talk as a suggestion for how you can begin to overcome uh, populism. Uh, I actually am a big fan of national service. There is a very good uh, National Commission on Military, National and Public Service that unfortunately uh, issued its report right at the moment that the coronavirus hit and so nobody paid any attention to it. But it's really a terrific idea because I believe that you really have to build a sense of national identity in a democracy if the political system is going to work. There has to be common narratives and perspectives uh, that allow citizens to think that they're part of the, you know, a common national uh, enterprise. And, you know, national service is one of the things that uh, could do that if it's structured correctly. It would have to be voluntary uh, at this point in our national history. But uh, just like military service today, it's something that could bring together people from different regions 
different social classes, which is something very important. I mean, living in Palo Alto, you know, unless you get something in your house repaired, you never see a working class person. Everybody has a PhD or they're, you know, highly educated the way you are. And I think that uh, this kind of um, service would expose people to, you know, other sorts of um, uh, Americans. Uh, so, uh, and, and furthermore, convince people that there are duties that citizenship involves um, beyond simply voting uh, and paying your taxes that actually make you an American. Thank you. And so this is going to be the last question and it's for Professor Chapman. Um, in 2013 in Shelby County v. Holder, the Supreme Court substantially weakened the Voting Rights Act which allows the federal government to ensure equitable access to voting in states with histories of racial discrimination. Many of these states turned out, being, turned out to be key swing states in the 2020 election. What implications does this have for our democracy and for the responsiveness of our political system to the needs of racial minorities? Sure, I mean, Shelby County v. Holder, I think is uh, more symptomatic than it is. Uh, I mean, it's certainly, I think, um, not the decision that I, I would have preferred. Um, and I think that it has had problems in specific places. Um, but I think that it's also just an indication that uh, we've reached a point where it is really, really hard um, to systematically address um, uh, access to the ballot. Um, and part of this is because it, um, you know, voting is largely administered on a state by state uh, level. And it's hard to kind of come up with formulas that are going to, over time, really hold up. So that was the problem in the case with Shelby County v. Holder is that the formula hadn't been updated recently enough. And so the court was able to make this argument um, that, uh, that it was the responsibility uh, of Congress to, to fix that problem. Um, and in some respects that's true, although of course um, that's uh, not clear that that's a totally good faith argument because no one expects Congress to be able to do anything. Um, but the problem I think is more general in that when we try and sort of identify where the problems are going to be uh, in particular places, we can make guesses, but they're not always going to be uh, the right the right thing. So I think we have to think pretty systematically about how to structure the relationship between um, sort of federal and state and local oversight of elections. And I think it, in particular, when it comes to thinking about setting eligibility and minimum standards for access, that should be the role of the federal government. And then states um, should be in a position to make kind of more, um, detailed judgments on on sort of smaller scale questions but i will add that it's it's worth thinking about some ways in which there have been real gains um in in recent decades in terms of sort of enfranchising uh, kind of historically disenfranchised groups and in, in particular i think um there have been has been real progress in uh, re-enfranchising felons in this country over the past couple of decades um and i think uh, it's important, I think, to continue to, to sort of push on that um, because there are sort of many, many people who are, remain disenfranchised, both because they are serving um, sentences and because they re remain un ineligible to vote even after they're out of prison. And so that's where I would sort of say we ought to focus a lot of attention. Well, we thank you so much. We are out of time, but Thank you, Anna and Francis and Emily and Michael for your wonderful presentations. And thank you very much, Chris, for doing such a great job moderating the Q&A. And thank you all for joining. I hope to see you next week for the final event of Democracy Matters. We will talk about some of the big challenges for the next decade.